genetic abuse meted out by covert narcissists is not the same as narcissistic abuse typical of overt or grandiose narcissists. Let's start with covert abuse. Narcissistic abuse, typical of covert narcissists. Number one, such abuse is passive aggressive, obstructive. It has to do with sabotaging, undermining, preventing, derailing, challenging uh, other people's wishes, hopes, tasks, assignments, uh, agendas, etc., etc. So there's a lot of passive aggression involved. The covert narcissist creates intricate webs and coalitions of flying monkeys and kamikaze, kamikaze suicide bombers. bombers. So the covert narcissist puts together um, networks of people and then activates them against the selected target. Now the covert narcissist is a narcissist. He has no empathy. Although he fakes empathy, he pretends to be a rescuer or a savior or a healer or a codependent or a victim. In reality, the covert narcissist is even more vicious and more psychopathic and more dangerous than the overt and the grandiose narcissist. And this kind of narcissist does not hesitate to sacrifice other people, to put them at risk, to compromise their interests, to ruin their lives, to put in danger their nearest and dearest, anything to obtain the outcomes of impacting the target, destroying the target, the target of vengeance, the target of envy, the tar malicious envy, the target of narcissistic rivalry, the target of some imagined fantasy gun or eye. When a target is settled on, when the covert narcissist decides this is my target and I'm going to destroy him or her, this kind of narcissist recruits people in a variety of ways, sex, money, flirtation, pretensions, pretending or faking. As I said, a savior, a healer, rescuer, a good guy or a good girl. And so this kind of covert narcissist puts together coalitions um, and attacks the target in the process, destroying the very people he uses without any remorse or regret or second thought, hiding behind the aprons of women and children as kind of human shields. This is typical of the covert narcissist. Now, uh, this is one element of what I call the occult narcissist, the hidden narcissist. It's a narcissist who hides behind, hides behind people, hides behind a facade, hides behind fake behaviors, hides behind social norms, hides behind cultural mores, hides behind superstitions and conspiracy theories and misbeliefs and misinformation hides behind hidden occult narcissist he fakes empathy he pretends to be what he is not an expert a rescuer a savior a healer he, he is helpful ostentatiously helpful he is smarmy absolutely smarmy he is altruistic or pretends to be altruistic and compassionate when actually this is prime manipulation. Being a covert narcissist he is adept at mimicking, imitating people, resonating with them, knowing not only which buttons to push, but how to become one with a flying monkey, how to create or generate the impression we are the same, we are, we are a brotherhood, we have the same goals and the same enemies. Let's go for them. A humble brag, a brag which masquerades as a form of humility. Sigmund Freud was the undisputed master of this kind of backhanded speech. And the whole phenomenon is known as 
pseudo humility or fake modesty or false modesty. Pseudo humility is the covert narcissist Swiss knife. It covers so many and caters to so many dynamics and so many needs that if I had to reduce covert narcissism into a single clinical feature, I would choose pseudo humility. Pseudo is as if, Helen Deutsch called it the as if personality. And there are many pseudos <laughs> in the covert narcissist makeup. There is pseudo stupidity. There is pseudo honesty. There is pseudo humility. It's all under the radar, subterranean, hidden, occult, and insidious. The as if personality. What is the role? What is the function? What's the point in being overtly modest, in your face, humble, <laughs> ostentatiously self deprecating? What's the aim of all this? Aim, you say? Nope. Many aims, many needs are gratified via pseudo humility in the case of covert narcissism. And let's start with the most obvious fishing for compliments, eliciting supply. It's a form of ostensibly inverted grandiosity, the aforementioned humble brag. It's a way of getting you to contradict and to dispute the statement, the humble statement so as to aggrandize the covert narcissist. So the covert narcissist would say, for example, I am so ugly. Um, and you, you're supposed to say you're not ugly at all. You're a handsome devil. <laughs> or the covert narcissist is supposed to say, um, I know there are many, I know there are people who are much more intelligent than I. And you're supposed to say, well, you are very, very, very intelligent. I doubt that there are many who are more intelligent than you. So your refutal by refuting the humble brag statement you're actually contributing to the grandiosity of the covert narcissist you're providing narcissistic supply this is function number one function number two to minimize expectations and therefore guarantee excellence triumph and victory the covert narcissist uses pseudo humility to reduce the the, the ambient expectation level to reduce the expectations of people around him to modify the expectation level of his human environment so that when he does do something when he does accomplish something it looks outsized it looks amazing expectations have been so low that he keeps surprising everyone with various features of his personality his eloquence his intelligence his perspicacity his insight and so on and so forth if you keep telling people i'm stupid i'm stupid i'm stupid and then you prove to be intelligent even moderately intelligent the contrast between your prior statements and your actual behaviors is such that you would tend to be overestimated so it's grandiosity by contrast next self-disclosure preemptive self-disclosure the covert narcissist discloses preemptively in an unsolicited manner no one asked him no one asked him to but he volunteers negative information about himself in a variety of ways and this negative information is a form of preemption when he is proven right or she is proven right when all these negative self-assessments are sustained with egregious behaviors or traits which are less than savory the covert narcissist could say well i told you so and then he doesn't feel guilty she doesn't feel blameworthy they don't feel shame why because they've been honest they there was self-disclosure there was openness and transparency. So why do, should they feel bad when they misbehave, when they hurt you, when they undermine you, when they sabotage you? It's, it's to be expected. They told you so. 
Function number three. Function number four. A defense against inevitable rejection, humiliation, and criticism. Remember that the covert narcissist is vulnerable, is fragile, fully anticipates ostracism, uh, mockery, ridicule, rejection, humiliation, and criticism are inevitable features of life, not bugs, but features. And so the covert narcissist is often avoidant um, and uh, mistaken for being shy when he's actually not shy at all, is grandiose. And inside he's seething re with resentment and, and envy. He hates the fact that he has to avoid, he has to withdraw. Um, the slings and arrows of societal uh, interactions and interpersonal relationships are too much for him. So, pseudo humility is a defense by being pseudo humble, fakely, fakely modest, falsely modest. The covert narcissist creates a um, firewall, a moat around his fortress, um, kind of a residue of self. Uh, humiliation, self-deprecation, and then when the inevitable rejection, exposure, humiliation, shaming, and criticism come, the covert narcissist can say, been there, seen it, done that. So nothing new. I've gone through it myself. I, I actually did it to myself. Sigmund Freud went through a phase of self-analysis <laughs> and then published his famous 1925 autobiographical study which was exactly this, a defense against the overwhelming blanket rejection um, of his work, of himself as a person, and the humiliation that he must have felt. Next, pseudo-humility allows you to test people. Their reactions tell you a lot about what they truly think about you. So the covert Narcissist um, self deprecates, self criticizes, self analyzes, self demeans, and then sits back and observes. As I said, the reactions of people around the covert narcissist tell him a lot regarding what people really think about him. So, this way, the covert narcissist ferrets out traitors and sources or potential sources of negative supply he would say for example um you know sometimes i'm very stupid sometimes i act very stupidly i may be intelligent but i'm not wise i'm really stupid and then he would sit back and he would observe and some people would say you're not stupid at all you're a fountain of wisdom and these people are in these people become members of the in group and some people would say yeah you're very self-destructive and often you act stupidly. You really should get a hold of yourself. And these people are in the out group. They are persecutory objects and enemies in the making. So pseudo-humility is a kind of litmus test who possesses the potential to become a fan, a follower, an acolyte, a psychophan, um, who could fit into the internal coterie and who should never, who should be avoided, should never be allowed into the inner sanctum of the covert narcissist. Case of the covert psychopath. The alloplastic defenses, coupled with the entitlement, coupled with the grandiosity, masquerade as morality. The, the, the covert narcissist displays a rigid, harsh, sadistic, unforgiving, sense of morality. He brags about his or her morality, he, he, uh, his morality or her morality. By the way, the vast majority of covert psychopaths are men, but they're of course women. So the morality in this case is ostentatious. It's pro-social, it's spiritual, it's communal, but in a kind of psychopathic way in your face. Look what a good person I am. Look how altruistic and charitable 
and giving and kind and generous I am. And if you dare to disagree, woe be tied. <laughs> you will pay the price. So this is the first thing. Covert psychopaths, therefore, are likely to be are likely to be perceived as normal. And this is exactly what Hervey Cleckley called the mask of normality. There's also a book by Martha Stout, the sociopath next door. We don't use the word sociopath in uh, in clinical circles and in academia. But what she meant is psychopath. So these psychopaths are our neighbors, our pastors, our medical doctors, law enforcement, our friends, our colleagues. They fit in, they conform, they work from inside the system, and they put on a facade of morality, spirituality, and communality. The covert psychopath, therefore, is high functioning, and his personality is organized. It's not chaotic like the borderlines of the narcissist, it's an organized personality. All covert states are forms of compensation. They're compensatory. Covert states compensate for failure, for defeat, for collapse, for an inability to obtain something. Narcissistic supply, in the case of the covert narcissist, and goals and accomplishments, in the case of the psychopath. So the collapse, in the case of the covert psychopath, consists of recurrent failures to attain goals. Covert psychopath doesn't care about narcissistic supply. He doesn't care about relationships. He cares about obtaining, securing, accomplishing goals. He is goal oriented and goal focused. That's, that means that the covert psychopath has an internal locus of control. He believes that he is the master. He's in charge, he's the boss, he's on top, he's Peterson's lobster. <laughs> so he has an internal locus, and that sets apart the covert psychopath from the narcissist and the borderline. They have an external locus of control. The narcissist, the covert psychopath appears to be self-sufficient. He actually emphasizes his self-sufficiency. I don't need anyone. His resiliency is, as I said, ostentatious. He broadcasts, you're all superfluous. I can live and manage and thrive and prosper and succeed without you. But it's all compensatory. It's all a mask. It hides a sense of defeat, a sense of pervasive defeat, a sense of failure, a collapse anxiety, insecurity, an internalized bad object which is harsh, sadistic, punitive, superego, or inner critic. It, this internal locus of control, this I'm a rock, I'm a, I'm breakable, I'm invulnerable, I'm impermeable, I'm untouchable, these messages, this kind of messaging to the environment, I call it invulnerability signaling. This has to do with a desperate attempt to cover up for the reality of the fragility, the vulnerability of the real person. The covert narcissist uh, exercises punitive avoidance and withdrawal. Exactly. The aim yes. is to increase or enhance the abandonment anxiety in the target. Yep. The covert narcissist gives the silent treatment, yep. withholds affection, yep. shows no emotions. This yep. is called reduced affect display. Uh, has usually flat attachment. Mm -hmm. So the covert narcissist is more of an absence than even the overt or grandiose narcissist. Yep. Is more of an absence, is more of a, of a void or yes. a vacuum, more of a black hole than even the grandiose overt narcissists. And as I said, he creates secret coalitions against you, smear campaigns, hiding cowardly, oh, cravenly gosh. behind others. 
And all this is intended to control the situation, to control you, and to obtain favorable outcomes, for example, to get you back, or to render you contrite and remorseful, or to punish you, pun punitive vengeance. Be the case as it may, these are the strategies used by covert narcissists. It's either him or you. It's a war to death. One of you, one of you must die, at least psychologically. 